good morning. Um, don't know who wrote the intro, but can you give me his name and details afterwards? It was really quite impressive. So I'm here today to talk to you, or at least pose a question anyway. So, you think the World Commission is just about financial services? Now, I was going to do my Dirty Harry impression and come up here fully loaded, but going through security at Star City is probably not the best thing to do, particularly not early in the morning. So what I thought I'd do was get you on your feet. Uh, because you've already been had coffee already, you've had muffins in there, they're starting to digest into your system now. So everyone on your feet, we're going to play a game. OK, and the game is quite simple. The game is sit down if. All right, first question. Sit down if you don't track negative customer feedback. So we have some exceptional fibbers or liars in the room, but I'll keep going, that's good. So everyone tracks negative customer feedback. Okay, so you do track complaints, but your board doesn't really discuss them, or more importantly, seek to identify any systemic issues. Couple of sitting. Thank you for your honesty. Your incentive structures. They favor the sale of one product, normally that of a higher margin, over the other. So a bit about incentives. Your weightings on performance metrics about how sales occur and or behaviors is materially less than the focus on the what, i.e. the results. That normally clears a few out. Guess what? Your products or services don't always work as they're supposed to, but shh, don't tell the customer. Good. You don't have clear board mandates around committees. The old board governance structures. You adopt more of a tell me versus show me approach to management's responses. So we've got four, five left. Did you bring the prize, Tim? You or your board talk about culture, but it's after focusing on sales revenue and after meeting targets. Three, congratulate the three who are standing, please. Excellent, well done. So that's just, if you like, um, a thought-provoking start. Gets you on your feet, starts to think you differently, because what I spoke about there had absolutely nothing to do with financial services. So let's touch briefly on about what we do know about the Royal Commission, because as Tim said, and I've been in the industry 25 years, um, it's not been a good look on financial services across Australia. Um, that's the least we can say. But many of the case studies are actually really old news. Okay, those in the industry have actually heard about this. In fact, for my sins, quite a lot of the stuff I've been doing in previous organizations has come to light as part of this process. Okay, but so within financial services, it's well known. The issue that we, the financial services industry hasn't dealt with too well is how it's been perceived externally to people who didn't actually understand this was actually going on. But the, the cases themselves, are well, they're old, they've been settled in most instances. And as it says there, the examples highlighted are very poor, but put it in context. Particularly when you're looking at some of the issues around the consumer space, the volume of transactions financial services players deal with, and in the Royal Commission, you're talking about one complaint, one person's issues. That not, that's not negating the issue of the person, but the Commission hasn't really focused, if you like, on the scale and what percentage this actually applies across the entire population. And we are talking seriously, seriously small. What you are seeing, though, and James Shipton is the new head of ASIC, OK? And he's very much talking about community expectation. So you are seeing a shift away from legislation towards community expectation. But if I was to hold a straw poll here of people around defying community expectation, I would get, I don't know, probably 100 different versions of it. 
So now imagine you're a CEO or a board member or an executive in financial services, and you've now got to manage a business, not only based on legislation, which naturally you can actually follow, but you've also got to think now potentially about community expectation and what that practically means. The other issue, obviously, so we're working through the third, raise, the third round, sorry, kicked off this week up in Brisbane. The interim report's due out in September. The final report's out in February next year. But who knows, if you like, when change will actually occur across the industry? And who knows then, if you like, who's going to actually be in government and power and what practically will happen in terms of either changes to legislation, changes to governors, changes to powers of regulators, et cetera. So that's a little bit of context about uh, the commission itself. But it's all about you. So what's in it for you? What are the key takeouts that, if you like, I've picked up from watching the last two, two and a bit weeks? The first one, really, and those in my syndicate will have heard me talk about this quite extensively. You've really got to be quite clear and document the key controls you have across your organization. But not only document, then test them. OK? You also heard, though, in the case of um, AMP in particular, be careful what you document. Quite often, people will put in emails, and I know from first hand because I've worked on insolvency and litigation and stuff like that. People put in emails what they never expect or never want to see come back in a courtroom. All right? And AMP was a good example of that. So please, as I said to my groups quite often, the phone is a beautiful thing. Use it. If you don't want to see what comes out the back end, use your phone. If you're happy with what you put in print, that's fine. So this thought, I mean, I think it was, Tim was talking about um, Yvonne's quote about hastening slowly, or someone else's quote, oh, Ken's, I think it was about hastening slowly. Particularly in the emotion, when you're caught up in the middle of it going, just bang, done, out. Phew, I felt better after that. We all do. But potentially rest and reflect. And if it is potentially controversial or could be controversial, and only you know your own industries and your organizations, but the phone's beautiful. This is a great opportunity for you as CEOs to start a conversation and to ask for views um, amongst your team, amongst your board. Because what you're seeing in financial services is a conversation starter around things like REM structures. Where do we sit? I know, uh, again, from experience in 1677, the weighting towards outcomes and behaviors isn't always 50%. I'm not saying it should be. But have a conversation within your organizations about where should it sit. And again, what you're seeing through the commission come out is this tension between short-term profit and longer-term advocacy. If you haven't started that conversation internally, um, suggest now's a good time to do it. And you can frame it and reference it off what's happening in the commission. So everyone talks about tone from the top, but that was so yesterday. The focus now is very much tone from the middle. And the expectation and where people are actually coming from is, OK, I hear where the board are coming from. I hear where the CEO is and the chair, et cetera, et cetera. That's nice. That's tick that box. But what I'm going to actually do is actually go out and talk to some of your middle layers, your middle layer of management, and see if their views and the board's views align. And quite often, when we're in management meetings, we get people come up, they present to us, and they tell you. They go, blah, 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 blah. And you go, excellent, phew, got off that list, nah, move on. It doesn't hurt to get off your proverbial and go down and say, show me. Show me where we do this. Show me how this happens. Let me sit on a call with a customer. Let me hear what we actually say, as opposed to, we've got this great scripting process, and it does this, and it does the other. So yeah. My takeout for that is really investigate, show, don't tell. And as I said before, um, this is a great opportunity for us as leaders to actually educate. Um, ambiguity and uncertainty drives opportunity. There are many businesses at the moment, not in financial services, seriously worried about the consequences of what's coming out here. But this is a golden time if you actually take the opportunity and wrestle it to the ground. So unfortunately, 
you are going to see creep. What comes out of the financial services sector isn't a flow into other industries. So again, be proactive. Think ahead. Across your organization, where are your soft spots? What is it that you hope never comes out in a Royal Commission? We've all got them. We all know where they are. Yeah? So start to think about it. Start to unpick it. This is an interesting one. So what I'm asking you to do there is understand not only the what, but how you generate revenue. And how sustainable is it? If the way you're generating revenue potentially doesn't have the customer at heart, doesn't drive long-term advocacy, how sustainable is it? You may have a window, no doubt about it. You may have been very successful historically, made a shitload of EBITDA on the way through. Okay, your valuation could be six times whatever. But if that's potentially at the detriment of the long-term advocacy of your customers, how sustainable is it? Again, the financial services space, there's things called inertia, products are set up, structures are put in place around rollovers, a whole raft of stuff to make it hard, make it hard for people to switch, make it hard for people to move out of things. But ultimately, the customer has been the one who has been suffering and struggling through this process. So my question to you is understand the how and the what. Prepare. Um, as Tim mentioned, I've come out of um, accounting firms, and I remember um, an old partner back in Cooper's and Liban days, for those in the room who remember that firm, uh, back in Manchester. He used to talk about the five Ps, and excuse me, this does include a swear word. He says, perfect planning prevents pissed off partners. Okay? And it stuck me for 20 odd years. All right? So plan, prepare. Don't assume it doesn't apply to you, because as we've said today, very much the broad thematics do. And be inquisitive. This is similar to the show and the tell piece, but be inquisitive. Quite often, we've got a lot on our plates as CEOs, as senior leaders in organizations, yet people come to us. It's quite, often, it's quite rare we actually get out and sit down with someone um, in the warehouse, someone on the shop floor, someone in accounts, someone in sales, someone on BD, okay? Because we're busy, all right? So we wait for people to come to us with information, are you getting that information just about good news? How do you actually set the tone yourself around, I want to know when things aren't going well? How can you frame that? How do you get that speaking up coming through your organization? So my comment there is be inquisitive and inspect what you expect. Because you as CEOs set the tone. Everything you turn a blind eye to, in essence, you're condoning across your organizations. So be inquisitive. And don't take it on your own shoulders. Delegate. Great conversation starter. Great opportunity for you really to test the skills of the people in your teams, to see how good they are, to take them out of their comfort zone and say, you know what? What do you think is going on here? Let me get your views. So really open it up to an active dialogue across your leadership team, across your boards about could this ever happen to us? And if it did, how would we do? What would we do? How would we react? So in summary, what's in it for you? It's quite simple. Date Cupid. Thank you. That's outstanding, Carl. Thank you. In fact, um, when you were going through some of your concepts, it actually, particularly the last, the second last one, when you're talking about you know, watching and being inquisitive inside your organisation, it reminded me of Laurie's uh, one-liner: "Believe your eyes." Now, anyone who's actually been through an organisational event with Laurie would know that you've just got to watch out for yourself because her eyes are on you. But it's actually true inside an organisation. Believe your eyes. Don't believe the BS. Yep. Okay. Very thought-provoking. Questions. And before we start, oh, what's your questions. view? So I am on the floor with this mic, and I may have some comments, and I will also be walking around picking on you because that's what I like to do. Um, we also have Claudette and Suzanne uh, around the room with questions, and we love questions. 
Um, but interesting, I have one comment, because it's hard for me not to, uh, was around community expectations. And what's been really interesting for me in the area of sustainability and social sustainability and community yep. is to see how Westpac has leveraged all of their social equity and goodwill in the community by putting out a lot of ads around their helicopters helping Australia. Yeah, very much now, so. Now, I do know inside that organisation there have been questions around that um, particular initiative for many years and the cost of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was decided to keep it. I suspect somebody in that organisation is going, thank God we kept it. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the social side or the community side and building up that goodwill uh, for your community advocacy certainly pays off in a, in a crisis. That's right, and I think that's definitely what they're trying to achieve, yeah, if you like, you show that softer side of financial services, and yeah. yes, okay, we may be getting smashed in the Royal Commission for the third week in a run, but by the way... We've done a lot of good in we, the community. We, yeah, we do good elsewhere. Yeah. That's a good observation, yeah, yeah, for sure. We've got a question at the front here. <coughs> Suzanne's on her way, young Graham. Oh, good, one of my members. Thanks for that. A uh, question, it's an oligopoly, really, the banks, and I'm thinking now also the skill set of the regulator yep. in these circumstances, and also the collusive behaviour in some instances between, say, investment rates where policy is determined with the regulator to uh, even go against the Productivity Commission in terms of the, uh, the sting to a certain group who aren't a higher risk, and the, the propaganda that comes from that. I, I take Anne's point there about the, the Westpac helicopter, when I see that, I don't think of the helicopter. I think, wow, they're not doing the right thing by me as an investor home loan, and I'm being penalised, and I'm not a higher risk. So I'm looking at that, but I'm just thinking now the role of the regulator and also the fact that it's an oligopoly. Any comments on that? Yeah, so obviously um, the regulators, if you like, had their time in this on there too. So uh, Michael Sadat from ASIC spoke, or was asked to present uh, last week, two weeks ago to the Commission. It's fair to say that ASIC came out of this a little bit bruised as well. Um, those of you in the consumer world, there's also ombudsmen, so you can actually go to ombudsmen. There's one, the financial services ombudsman. Um, they got fairly well bruised through that process too. Um, to your point about potentially not being um, as incisive and clear as they could have been. In fact, Commissioner Hayne took ASIC to task um, quite vehemently around why are you engaging in conversation? It is the law. They should be doing it. Yeah. So to your point, I think what you're going to see coming off the back of it, not only is it going to be changed within financial services, but definitely change within how regulators engage in financial services. Yep. Um, and then if you like, the ancillary people who sit behind that, particularly the ombudsman's offices and stuff like that, again, they'll have to change as well. Question up the back now. Can't see his face. I wish I was taller. You certainly stand out. <laughs> I Thank still you. need him. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Carl. Um, just a question for you. The, uh, a lot of what's come in the commission has been around conduct, and yeah. uh, in particular, if you think about the banking as a profession and the role of, uh, of, the role of, of that profession in society, um, everyone from accountants to engineers to plumbers are professionalized. What are your thoughts on the professionalization of banking as, a, as an outcome of the commission? I think it's going to happen, yeah. I mean, a lot of the comments have been around, if you like, training. So historically, when I started at CBA, there was a lot of investment in training. It's fair to say that that investment um, has scaled down, it's in part replaced by technology. But again, you have heard coming out of the commission, there has been commentary around there isn't sufficient training going on within the organisations, if you like, to be able to deliver what they're supposed to deliver uh, to the community. So that will come out in terms of some, some changes. Um, I know some of the banks themselves have actually focused on it um, directly already ahead of the commission in terms of what they can do um, around it. But I think that whole uh, focus on around professionalism and lifting the, the capability internally across financial services will continue and will be one of the consequences that comes out of it. Can I make a suggestion if you um, have your hand up and please ask questions. You, none of you are backward in coming forward in our syndicate meetings, as I recall. Um, so I, I think that was Matt over the back, yeah. right, Matt? Matt Tice and Graham before. If you could just let us know your name and which syndicate you're with, then the rest of the group will, will know who you are. Um, that would be great, thank you. So who would like to take the next plunge? I might, I might plant one there while we're getting a microphone over here. So, Carl, you, you spoke about 
um, rather than putting things in writing to talk in the first mm. instance. Now, I, I, I think I understand the context in mm -hmm. which you said that, but could you just amplify that for us? You're not trying to avoid scrutiny here. No, so pretty much as I said, particularly around discovery. Um, so uh, legal firms are getting exceptionally smart about how and what they discover. So the fact that you deleted it's irrelevant. They'll go back and they'll re repair hard drives and reconstruct stuff like you wouldn't believe. They've got the power and the reach now and the forensic firm's out there too. So it's actually good in a way if you've lost stuff because you call in a forensic accountant to come and repair it for you. But just know that potentially the skills and things he's using over here, if he gets tapped on the shoulder by someone else, he'll bring it, bring it to bear too. So again, it really is about you talking to your teams about um, controlling their emotions, particularly in the middle of whatever, a crisis or an issue or how you're actually playing it through, um, how you actually engage and, and what conversations you have with your board too. Because again, employees are getting savvier. All right? And they will ask questions about, so where was this documented? Show me the policy that showed this. Okay, how have you come to a view that I'm a hopeless employee? Yeah? So again, particularly, because they're well aware now, and there's lawyers out there, we know, there's probably lawyers in the room, so I better be careful, but no. <laughs> um, there's lawyers out there now who actually will, will go to people and say, you know what, I can get you X. Dead easy, all right, I'll throw a few emails out, show me that, show me the other, they won't have it, up goes your payout, and off we go. Yep. So, so we're talking about ethics, and then you bring up the subject of lawyers. That doesn't make sense. But anyway, we have a question over here. Chris Glenn from uh, Syndicate 62. One of my observations, and I've only been reading the media, was the incentive structures that appear to be in the financial services sector today compared to, say, 20 years ago, seem to be often misdirected and extremely large. And yep. I've had personal experience where that's created behaviour that... Uh, is all wrong. How much do you think that's had an impact on it and what, they do, what do they need to do about it? Oh, I think it's had quite a, particularly on the case that has been raised, it's had quite a big impact, no doubt about it. And they've, each of the banks who's been up there has actually acknowledged that. Um, ANZ, for example, um, in the small business one that was two weeks ago, recognised that three quarters of the incentive structures were geared towards that particular outcome at that particular time, which wasn't necessarily in the customer's needs or customer's interests. So definitely um, the historical legacy REM structure um, approach has been found out for this process. Now, the banks have changed that. They have put in place um, various gate openers around who gets a, a bonus or an incentive and, and if, like, how's that triggered. Um, so definitely they have changed around that. And I know personally from experience that used to be um, no one ever asked in financial services how Joe or Bill or Mary got 300% of target. You used to go high five down Jaw Street, here's your ticket to Bali, off you go, son, or girl, or whoever it was. Now, there is a lot of scrutiny going into um, how they've actually generated that. So they will triangulate various sources of data internally around complaints, around losses, around a whole raft of different factors, if you like, to make sure that the, the quality of sales are actually occurring. But this, is, I think, is, is something that you across your organizations also need to think about, too, is that balance across REM. And if you're like, what are you actually practically driving and what are you rewarding and how sustainable is it? Sorry, I can see a hand up there. So we've got two hands. We've got yeah. A, yeah, one there. Two hands on the back. And gentleman here. We'll go with the lady first, if we may. In just the back here, I think, in the blue scarf. Thanks, Claudette. Hi, Janetta Russell from Syndicate 72. It seems to me um, the comments were made that um, Ray Williams was the last person with his team to go to prison, and now there's a lot of discussion about prison, but there seems to be two sides to this. One side is if the board's going to take the rap and the CEO, um, it's the, if the board knew, yes, sure, they should go to prison, but what about the situations of the information transfer to the board and keeping the board in the dark? Because that's been always a, a, a long issue. Yeah, very well. And you're actually spot on. Ray White, so, so Ray White, <laughs> Ray Williams, uh, not the real estate guy, uh, was the last person who actually went to, to jail. And that was HIH, and that was almost 20 years ago. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, so a couple of uh, comments. Um, even through the GSC, a lot of us who were in that space and actually did a lot of work in that space were really surprised um, that ASIC wasn't able to nail um, certain directors of certain very large institutional businesses that, if you like, did destroy a lot of shareholder value and did leave a lot of creditors swinging. Okay? 
Um, so that wasn't a good look for the industry, uh, particularly going through a GFC. If you can't get someone there for what actually happened, then geez, uh, what the hell's going on? Um, so a couple of observations then around board structures that are coming out of here. Definitely, the, um, and this is relevant to everyone in the room, it's how you bring that bad news up and how you actually create a culture of speaking out in organizations is proving really challenging. There's a lot of mantra and talk commentary from the top about speak up, but what happens is, from experience, you have this permafrost across the middle, all right, that basically stops it. So you might have someone in the whatever um, accounts department or wherever they are going, shit, I've got a problem here, I've seen this, this, and they tell their manager, and the manager goes, oh, geez, then I'm going to see Ken today, he's in a bad mood, I'll just part that one, all right? Um, so it never actually bubbles up. So across your organization, you've got to think about how you can actually find a different mechanism for that to occur. And some things I've seen work quite well are actually um, in-line reviews and out-of-line reviews. So you actually provide an opportunity for people in your organizations to go and talk to someone who isn't necessarily in their team about an issue. Right? So that may allow it to come up. The other thing that's actually happening that's out there is something called bear. Okay? And it's not a big grizzly thing that goes rah. All right? It's all about... Um, an executive um, accountability regime in banking. And there is potentially coming out of that a lot of consequences. This actually came out of the UK for the GFC. Um, so the UK banks, as you know, got heavily smashed. And there was a lot of accountability brought back on to the executives within financial services. So we are picking up that bear there, and that does have uh, prison time, and it does talk about accountable executives. So one thing you may have seen at the Royal Commission is no CEO of a big four bank or any of the financial services players has appeared in there. It's all been, if you like, the product owners or the risk people or the sales people in those organizations who are actually fronting up. And this is, if you like, to start to get them ready for when Bear kicks in, because they're the accountable executives. They're the people responsible for actually execution. And ultimately, potentially, if it doesn't go well, we'll go to jail around this. So that puts in an interesting dilemma within the industry and the parallel out to the UK. The UK really struggled and still struggles now to attract talent into financial services. Because, I mean, you're doing the best you can, right? It's pretty hard to have the big house potentially behind you as the consequence of not doing your job. Yeah? But in the UK, that's exactly what they're seeing. The graduate take up and the graduate desire to move into financial services isn't strong anymore. So we've got to be very careful here in terms of how we frame this and how we pitch it. Our banks are exceptionally strong. They are still in the top five, top 10 in the world. We didn't have a GFC, all right? So again, whilst the Royal Commission can go, it's all doom and gloom, some context about how good they have been and how strong regulation has been over here shouldn't get lost. Great point. We have a question with the gentleman here. Uh, Stefan Szatinski, I'm uh, the chair of 120. Uh, you touched upon a little bit about the global context, yeah. but just talk a bit more about how Australia ranks versus other comparable countries and it, what is there to emulate or not to emulate from the regulatory environment in other countries? Yeah, sure. So as I said, um, Australian banks did, and Australian financial services did exceptionally strong. Uh, principally, a couple of reasons behind it. Uh, the role of the government, the role of APRA was really very good with the big four in particular. All right? Also, ironically, <laughs> the Australian banks, well, the Aust most of the Australian banks weren't the sharpest tools in the shed, right? So when all this exotic stuff was happening in America and happening in Europe, uh, we didn't really have the people with the capability and the will and desire to actually get off and do something. We didn't go chasing exotics. Some of the banks did, okay, some did, and they obviously got impacted more than others. But if you like, we just uh, sat with our home loans, we sat with our business banking loans, we sat with our investments in wealth, we were fairly well contained across Australia. So that lack of um, greed, um, definitely um, the incentive structures were more balanced than those um, global peers were, actually stood us in good stead. Because the stuff obviously coming out of the, the US in terms of how they were gearing upon gearing upon gearing was, was really um, quite detrimental uh, to their, similarly in the UK, around the mis-selling of products and the loading of products onto people, notwithstanding the fact they didn't know they even had it, uh, was actually true. The other interesting thing I will actually throw into the mix is, um, so in the US in particular, if you default on a, a consumer debt, 
There's no consequence to you personally. There's no bankruptcy regime personally. So what was actually happening in the GFC in America were literally people going, oh, catch, keys, cars, bang, 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 I'm out of here. In Australia, there is consequence through bankruptcy. So people, if you like, are a little more um, measured in terms of then how they will interact with their financial services player. Yeah? And that may actually, in a way, be a good thing in terms of preserving the value that's actually held here. The other country that did well, ironically, was Canada. So as ourselves in Canada skirted around the outside, a little blip here and there, but nothing much. But it was the rest of the world that really struggled. It's amazing. So I did mention earlier that we've got a hashtag, CEO Connect. I would appreciate it if you did not quote Carl in saying that our bankers were not the smartest, sharpest tools in, in the, the shed. shed. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would not do our brand a whole lot of good if, right if, now, my friend. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Chapman House Jules always apply in CEO meetings. Do we have any final question for Carl? We do have, we have two in the middle. I, Bernard, you're on later. We'll go with this gentleman. Uh, I'd, I'd also like Bernard to get a question. mic either. Jeez, well, I'd Bernard also like to mic. get a question, not a comment. So. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Cushion, Syndicate 62. My question revolves around leadership. Yep. Um, prior to the Banking Royal Commission, essentially they dragged the Prime Minister and the government kicking and screaming to instigate and start the Royal Commission into banking. Um, I'd just like your comment on that. And secondly, based on your uh, presentation on Date and Cupid, have you had a call from Optus? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't had a call yet. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think the government was reluctant to do it. Uh, they probably either didn't know or didn't ask the right question about what was likely to come out of this thing. A lot of this stuff actually has come out through sanity inquiries already. So, for example, um, there's a big chunk of the uh, business banking case studies around Bankwest, right? CBA had to pre present Bankwest. This is the third time they presented the acquisition of Bankwest. So it was never going to come out there. So maybe Turnbull thought in the way, you know what, there's nothing here going to hurt us. And it was only, if you like, through how those case studies have been constructed and how the customer detriment piece has been so well explained, yeah, that everyone's gone, wow. And even that's forced the government to reflect in terms of then, should we have done this earlier? I think the challenge will be is, if they extend it, uh, what's, what more do they want out of this? And if there is a criticism of the commission, and my own personal view on this is, they actually don't know what they're solving for at this point in time. They haven't got a hypothesis out there. They're testing and working back to see if that actually holds. All they're doing is gathering information from the bottom up. So to me, the question back on Dehane will be, so what? You've got all this info. You've got all these insights. So what are you going to do about it? What was it? What's the major trigger? What's the 80-20 thing that we will look at in business to say, if I have two things I can change, what's the big thing I'm going to focus on? if you like, to allow, if you like, a more sustainable financial services sector to occur. Great. Um, I am going to have to call it quits there so we can, we can move on. But, but Carl, just a, just a couple of key takeouts. The, the, apart from the fact that you've actually taken us on a journey through not just the Royal Commission and demonstrated your, uh, your great knowledge of that particular sector, but I think you've put a red flag up the pole for all of our industries. Um, doesn't matter what organisation you're in, doesn't matter what industry you're in, there will be potential flow and effects here. And if I took two key words out of your presentation, the first one was talk. You know, talk within your organisation, talk about balanced objectives, talk about uh, leveraging the fear of the Royal Commission flow yeah. and effect. Um, talk about the tone in your organisation. As a board, step into the organisation a bit more than perhaps you normally would to understand that things are going on. Um, and talk to educate, because the best way to learn, of course, is to uh, teach. Um, the second thing is to watch to watch out for the flow on impacts, to watch for the soft spots in your organisation, um, to actually walk around and manage by walking around and actually seeing what's going on in the organisation, um, and watch out for that dichotomy between delegation and actually knowing what's really happening. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I took a huge amount out of Carl's presentation. He's demonstrated enormous knowledge um, and great professionalism. And Carl, on behalf of the team, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.